Maria McCurlin, memoirist. Oh, very good. Very good. That's a hard word. Yeah. And I've come in my persona as a, a writer instead of usual. I've got a sort of Toya Wilcox wig on. Yes. You haven't gone, you have, you haven't gone full Murder, She Wrote. Um, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a sort of Murder, She Punked. It's, uh, yeah. No, it's like kind it. of pinky. It's in the book. The wig is in the book. That's all. It, it features. So was this a kind of a, a lockdown project for you? Well, it's not. I sort of started in lockdown, yes, because, you know, twiddling thumbs and you can only watch Joe Exotic and uh, uh, what, what else? Ozark we were watching, weren't we? Um, and then I got poorly. I had to be in hospital and so on. That's in there. Um, and then I sort of didn't do it for a while and then I did. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's interesting when people kind of sit down and try to do this because you've done it in kind of bite-sized chunks, haven't you? Yes, it's about each section of my life. I've always loved bicycles, so from the get-go... Bicycle, which bike? Da, 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 da. So bikes through the through the ages, and of course, as we know these days, bikes don't last very long. They get nicked, and da 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 da. Oh and um, the last time was last week, and I caught somebody d taking my saddle off. No, forgot to tell you that. Yeah, I was yes. in the hairdressers, and I was just paying, and then I saw this sort of ne'er do well got his, my saddle under his arm and was fiddling with the back bike, back wheel. Stupid of me, flick levers, which means you can get them off easy. And so I just went out and did, just went and I sort of, no! <laughs> <laughs> like I, this animal sound came out, like I was about to give birth. And then, you know, people stopped and gathered around like, oh, here's a show. Um, yeah. And then I ended up feeling sorry for him because, you know, it was just for a quick fix obviously he did so you gave him the bike no, yeah i gave him the bike and, <laughs> and two, your car uh, and 200 pounds <laughs> no i just said put it back put the bike back and then somebody said to me the police are coming the police are coming and he looked so panic stricken and i just said to him run <laughs> run i'm giving you a head start your time starts now yeah, yeah. just you know nobody I, I, I was going for lunch i didn't want to hang around for the police no and also he hadn't done it but anyway yeah bikes get stolen bikes get destroyed etc so all the bikes through my life with kind of like how i was changing each revolution of the wheel if you like contributing to each evolution of my life yes. and now as i say on the back of the book yeah, uh, that, that, I've, that i've known you for years but actually i must have just spent all this time talking about myself because i didn't know a lot of these stories yeah i know but the problem is when you kind of dredge up your life is I wouldn't come to you or any of my friends and say, oh, well, this happened or that happened. You know, things happen and then it passes and then you kind of forget about it or put it in a box. And it's boring to talk about things like, you know, I have shared things with you in the past. Yes. And, and likewise, you know, that's what friends do. Yeah. But when you go in depth about these things and who knows why you put things in a book about your life um, and leave some things out. Um, but I think you're very self-aware in the book. Like, looking back, you're very aware of that you kind of invented yourself. When you came to London, you decided to become this yeah, other woman. Yeah, which is, I was just talking to Lee Francis outside, who has been many inventions, yeah. about it's much easier because then it's not you. It's not, you know, you, you're you creating this character, if you like. And I grew up as a working class girl in Bletchley in a council house. My dad worked in a factory. My mum was a housewife. And, you know, my first boyfriend, his father was a um, literary, English literary professor at UEA, you know, specialising in Milton. And his mother was a psychotherapist. I mean, where does this little girl sit in that? And I, I just remember feeling like... Like you never enough, but you get around that by asking lots of questions yeah. and making sure that it doesn't come back to you when people ask questions about you. So tell me about your, you know, I never wanted to do that. Well, because this is weird because I think we are all that thing, aren't we? Uh, that weird mix of attention seeking and also very shy. Yeah. Which you know, it's very, you can't explain that to anyone. Yeah, it's like you want to push it back, but you also it's funny, Graham. You know, because I talk a bit about fame. People say to me, "Why aren't you more famous?" And I don't think I ever wanted to be enough. Yes, of course, getting free things and um, having money and all of those things and being on. But the, as you know, there's a price to pay. And I watched Robbie Williams' documentary this week, I which know. is you know made me think, why did you not just stop doing it, mate? But it's like an addiction. That adoration is like an addiction, but it fame costs, it as is. they say. But you in say you're not famous, film. but your face has been on telly. Well, my face has been on telly, and my voice is a bit known. But people do say to me a lot. I get this a lot. Um, you look 
really familiar. Where do I know you from? And of course, that's a way to see, you know, in a minute, it's going to be you've been on television or what have you been in, etc, etc. So I have that sort of face. And it's either that they think I work in the co-op or the bank or something like that. But I always say now, because it closes things down, when someone says, your face looks terribly familiar, I say, that's because we've slept together. <laughs> so I've managed to get Bill Nye on that one, who looked momentary, very panic-stricken. <laughs> And Christian Slater, when we were at the other place, yes. um, who looked equally horrified. And then I was with you when we went to see Madonna and um, Rosie O'Donnell. Do you remember? I <laughs> yes. was there. You looked at me slightly horrified. And she said, oh, I've only slept with nine people. I'll have to check. <laughs> So it's a good way of closing things down. Yeah, you push her into double digits. Uh, yes. <laughs> well done. Well done, you. Um, you talk about relationships in the book, and there's a, a really weird story, which is why I love it. Okay. And, and also, it's kind of uh, what, I lo- what I really like about the book is, so it's very funny... Uh, there's a lot of sadness in the book, but also it's there's darkness in the book. So you were, I guess, about 11 or 12, yeah, yeah. and there was a boy... Was he trying to flirt with you? Yes, I think we used to play in the wreck, on the seesaws, and he used to fl- flirt with me, and he did that. Boys used to have spitting competitions, I think. You probably remember that. Yes. Um, and Bef- one... Before afternoon telly. <laughs> yes, exactly, before, <laughs> before Crossroads at 4.30. And um, he one day changed his trajectory and spat on my back, which was horrible. Um, but that was how people flirted in the olden days, playing British Bulldog, things like that, and, you know, spitting on someone's back. It was not a winner. As far as I was concerned, yeah. but but then you know he was one of the boys that played in the wreck. He's a bit older. I got a bit older, and then there was a murder that happened. I used to do a paper round. There was a murder. <laughs> Um, I don't know why this is funny, but it makes me laugh. I know. And <laughs> Clockwork Orange had just come out and we'd been to see it, the Droogs and... Uh, uh, what did they talk? Nasdaq or something. They spoke in different... I didn't really understand it because I was too young, but it was... Anyway, there's a murder in Clockwork Orange, which is why he goes on to um, get to therapy. And this was likened to a Clockwork Orange murder. And the defense. So was it a big fame? Was it coming in the papers? This murder. It was massive. Yeah, it was massive because I was saying to you earlier, things don't like that don't seem to happen. And, but anyway, they do happen. Of course they do. But in a tiny little place called Bletchley, and it was uh, Richard Palmer who had done the murder. Your flirting boy. And my flirting boy had done the murder. Yes, it's, that's all I look for now in a man. I know. And- <laughs> but will, will he kill for me? <laughs> And it was, you know, it was horrible. And I had to cancel my paper round that week because there was yeah. a murderer on the loose. See, the, I'm amazed I don't know that story because I would tell people that story like, within minutes of meeting them. If I was in the lift going down to think, okay, by the way, I know someone who's uh, murdered someone. Yeah, and, and his defence was, I remember this, and it's, you know, on public record, his defence was he couldn't possibly have done this because Clockwork Orange was, a, a you know, X-rated or whatever. You had to be... 18 and he was only 16 at the time like kids didn't get in I saw it and I was only 14 you know you put on a bit of pearly eyes lipstick some eyeliner and put your head down and paid your money and that's it and a fetching purple wig Uh, another (laughs) bit of your life I love it when you decide you're going to do stand up so you weren't you weren't called Maria McCurlane no, I was, this was the 80s, so people had comedy names. There was Mark My Words, for example. It's a bit like drag get drag names now. Yes. But for stand-up... What was Joe Brown called? The Sea Monster? The Sea something? Monster, yes. Um, I know, there was a reason for it, and it's a joke that led up to that. And it was a very funny joke, but I can't remember it. Um, so I was Maria Callas, spelt C-A-L-L-O-U-S. Now, it's a long time since Maria Callas, the opera singer, has died, <laughs> but it was, you know, my attempt <laughs> at humour at the time. And again, it was like disassociated associating yourself from who you really are. Early disassociation yeah. to the stand-up circuit. And I'd, you know, just come out of sort of bad eating disorder and I was a bit mad and didn't know who I was. And I thought, yeah, stand-up's the thing for me. Perfect. <laughs> and when I wrote, I wrote a lot of stuff, which I thought was very funny, and I showed it to Vicky Pyle, who produced Smack the Pony and Green Wing and various other things. And she said, yeah, but where are the jokes? 
And I said, but it's just, isn't it enough to have funny thoughts about things? And she said, no, an audience has to feel confident enough to know that there's a lead up, pause, and then a punchline and they can relax. That's they know they know where to laugh. They know where to laugh. So I had to rethink that. But you did it. You went to the Edinburgh Festival. I mean, you I were successful. I did. I did go to the Edinburgh Festival with lovely Johnny Immaterial. Again, a funny comedy name. Um, he's a brilliant children's writer now. But one night, I think it was a late night live, you know, it was from 12 o'clock till 2 in the morning and people were very drunk. And in those days, they used to be really horrible. Now, I think audiences are a bit more relaxed or maybe not. I think they're getting horrible again. But anyway, uh, are they? Yeah, are they? Well, good job we don't do stand-up anymore. And, and I was just going down the toilet and people shouting, show us your bosoms and da, 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 and you're too ugly to have sex with and lots of things like that. And I just thought, oh, I can't be... I'll pretend to faint. <laughs> And that's what I did. <laughs> and apparently, in comedy circles, that's not good. People don't think, you know, you're meant to <laughs> style it out. You're meant to take your punishment, even if you only do five minutes of a 20-minute set. Don't faint. You don't. No, don't, don't faint. Um, I, <laughs> I like... Uh, I learned how to faint at drama school, so I thought I should put it into good use, Graham. Do you see? Come on. And why did you stop doing stand-up? I think... Um, I stopped because I started to get other work, writing and performing, and, you know, I was starting to get a bit known in that circuit. And also I had a partner who died, and then I, after he died I kind of did a lot of gigs that I had to do because I'd booked them, so the Secret Policeman's Ball at the Duke of York's Theatre. Yeah. And I was just like this walking horror, really, and not functioning. And I just thought, I can't do this. I can't stand up. It's talking about the tears of a clown. Yeah. I felt like I was sort of standing outside myself. Yeah. And you can't say, hey, here's a funny thing. My partner just died. Well, some people do. They do now a bit. People now do much more of a sort of exposing of their, whatever they have, ADHD yeah. or whatever. And but yeah, so You feel like now comics would be slightly thrilled because they're oh, there's my Edinburgh show. Yes, yeah. yeah. A whole hour <laughs> yeah, on death. Yeah, yeah, I'll cry at the end. Uh, yeah, very award mine. Well, yeah. maybe we're, we're, we weren't as cynical, perhaps. You then. weren't as Maria Callas as you thought. I wasn't, yeah. It was a stupid name to choose and I didn't do very well at it. So I kind of, you know, it had a natural ending for me. But yeah. I still... And I love... My favourite joke, which made me want to do it in the first place, was Steve Wright. I don't know if everyone yes. remembers him. Not from Radio 2, but the comic, which was... Um, if at first you don't succeed, then maybe skydiving is not for you. <laughs> Which I own. I loved him. Yeah. Is he still funny? Uh, I think he is. He's still going, isn't he? Yeah, people, are, people behind the glass are nodding. Yeah, good, good, like, good. Like, like they know. <laughs> yeah. people, Steve Wright's family are going, this is not funny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was the 1800s, by the way. <laughs> it when... was a long time ago. Um, and what did you... Did you learn anything about yourself writing this book? I learnt that um, your memory can come back to you because I was thinking, oh, my goodness, just been talking to Lee about this as well. He's got a book out in March, memoir. Um, and... I did what they did with some of the people that got kidnapped with um, McCarthy, John McCarthy. Oh, yeah. And uh, one of them, I think the American something man, he went through his life every day. He went through his life and every day he tried to remember a bit more about this bit. and every... So if you put yourself into a state of kind of lull, you can. And I remembered a lot more than I thought I did. Those bits were harder than obviously latter. Yeah. But um, I, I learnt quite a lot about the upbringing and how it affects you. Well, how it affects everybody who has different upbringings. You know, whatever they are, happy or sad, is going to have a, an effect on you. And it's how you play those effects. It's, you know, how do you play the car, the hand you're dealt? Yeah. And at the end of it, I mean, are you sort of, are you glad you did it? Did you come out kind of feeling, oh, look at me, I'm, you know, I'm a survivor? Well, at the end of it, I just thought, does anyone care? <laughs> <laughs> we do, we do. I, I know, but no. At the end of it, I thought, well, there, you know, I'll, I'll I've done eighty thousand words. Yeah, and um, hopefully, when they edit it down, it'll be five thousand words. <laughs> no, no, it's no, a, no. It's a whole book. Uh, Bumps in the road is the name of the book. It's a memoir. It is out on Thursday, the seventeenth. Yes. Uh, good luck. Hey, thanks for talking to me about it. Well, no, I, I, why wouldn't we? Because you know we have people who write books all the time. And so. just remember, in future, you know, you said I scarcely knew any of these stories. If you ask me questions, Graham, <laughs> I may tell you the answer. I've got lovely stories from nineteen sixty. 
63. Oh, that's good. By the way, Steve Wright's still alive and he's only 67. What? I know. I thought he was about 90. <laughs> I think he went bald early. Oh, that's, my goodness. Yeah. He was young. Yeah, I know. Who knew? Anyway. Funny man, though. Look up his work if you're thinking. Well, you can go see him. He's only 67. <laughs> He's probably on tour. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll talk to you tomorrow morning uh, in our yeah. in our normal slot. Yeah, uh, thank goodness I don't have to do this again. It's scary. Oh, you've done very well. I need to talk about my film and my play that's on in the anyway, West End. Anyway, here's Olivia Rodrigo, uh, <laughs> vampire. I'll talk to you tomorrow morning. Thanks so much.